coming to worship today. You are with uh, Pastor Jim Dean, and we are all together worshiping with uh, Whittier United Methodist Church in Whittier, North Carolina. Thank you for joining us online. Thank you for joining us here in the sanctuary this morning. As we begin this morning, let's all stand as the candle is blown.
that song was the youth minister in my town, and, oh. uh, Rich Mullins. Yes. And, uh, and uh, so I knew him before he was popular. <laughs> but he oh, was cool. uh, one of the great things. And so I've been singing that song since high school. I said, uh, what a great song. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, today is Christ the King Sunday, and we're talking about what does that mean to be a follower of Christ the King? And uh, we're going to be talking about that in our readings. We're going to talk about it in our prayers. We're going to talk about that in the message later on today. So as we uh, as we turn in our uh, either up on the screen or in our uh, yep, what are the bullets? I'm bullets. Sorry, golly, kind of brain lapse there. Uh, let's begin. Uh, let's do our call to worship followed by our opening prayer. Let's read both of these together. It is done. God has always been in charge, yesterday and today. Even when the things seem out of control, God's reign is on its way. Let us prepare the way for God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross, that all people might come within the reach of your saving embrace. Clothe us in your spirit that we, stretching out our hands in loving service for others, may bring those who do not know you to an awareness and love of you, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God forever. Amen. Let's stand as we sing, Jesus shall reign, 157. <laughs> two other criminals to be executed with Jesus. When they arrived at a place called the Skull, they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They do lots as a way of dividing up his clothing. 
The people were standing around watching, but the leaders sneered at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he's really the Christ sent from God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him. They came up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, If you really are the King of Jews, save yourself. Above his head was a notice of the formal charge against him. It read, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals, hanging next to Jesus, insulted him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us! Responding, the other criminal spoke harshly to him. Don't you fear God, seeing that you've already been sentenced to die? We are rightly condemned, for we are receiving the appropriate sentence for what we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, I assure you that today you will be with me in paradise. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. As we come to our community prayer time, I want us to remember those that we have in our congregation that we need to pray for. We celebrate Greg and Jeannie being back with us today. Greg, I'm so glad you're here. I love you, Alice, Mom. Uh, Lynn's mom and her cousin, Doreen, let's continue to remember uh, them. Let's remember Carol as he's uh, struggling with what he says is pneumonia, and he sounded very sick, so I don't doubt him. <laughs> so we'll, uh, let's remember him. Uh, Avril and Gladys Sims, let's remember them. Um, Mary will remember you December 6th, a surgery, but... Um, in the meantime, it's awful scary with the impending surgery and knowing you're active and like to move around. We'll pray for quick and speedy recovery, but healthy recovery along the way as well. Uh, the family of Bobby Thurman, who passed this week, his wife Audrey, we just remember them this week. And uh, Sarah are with our Bless. Um, do we have any silent prayer requests around this country or anything that we need to just Pray for uh, the Lord knows who those are. I'm going to give you a moment of silent prayer and then I'll offer up a prayer for all of these folks that we pray. <laughs> Almighty God. From the beginning of time to the end of eternity, you have chosen to use your power and majesty to love us, to redeem us, to shape us as your people. King of kings and Lord of lords, you became weak so that you could comfort the strength of sin and death, confounding the ridicule with your resurrection. Spirit of God resting upon us, may your power inflame us with your peace. May your peace touch us with your grace, and may your grace fill us with your hope, and may your hope lead us into your kingdom. God and community, holy in one, may your word be on our lips as we pray together as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. You know, one of the things that we rebelled about in the United States of America was being under the rule of a king. We didn't like a king. We didn't want a king. Who wants a king? King, no taxation without representation. And they threw the tea into the harbor in Boston. But Jesus came and he was a king. A different kind of king. Not a king that demanded but a king that encouraged, a king that was there to show us through his actions and his behaviors how to be 
So as we come to our offering time this morning, we realize that there's nobody compelling us to give. Nobody's putting a gun to our head and no tax man is coming by demanding that we give our offerings. But as we give, we are saying Christ is King. Christ is the Lord. And so as we give, and as we continue to give throughout the rest of this year, may we give realizing that we're giving to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>
The New Testament reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. I'm sorry, 11 through 20. By being strengthened through his glorious might, so that you endure everything and have patience, and by giving thanks with joy to the Father, he made it so that you could take part in the inheritance in life granted to God's holy people. He rescued us from the control of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. He set us free through the Son and forgave our sins. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the one who is first over all creation. Because all things were created by him, both in the heavens and on the earth, the things that are visible and the things that are invisible, and whether they are thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He existed before all things, and all things are held together in him. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the one who is first born from among the dead, so that he may occupy the first place in everything. Because all the fullness of God was pleased to live in him, and he reconciled all things to himself through him, whether things on earth or in the heavens, he brought peace through the blood of his cross. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was ten years old, my friend Jeff and I he was a neighbor boy. He lived near me. We decided to form our own club. We were going to have our own club. I don't know if you ever had a club when you were growing up, we, but we were going to form our own club. So there had to be a location for this club. Where was this club going to meet? And we decided he had an open door wood shed in the back yard of his house where there was a lawn and some other gas cans and things like that. And so, oh, that's going to be our location. No one will ever think of looking for us there in that secret spot. Then we had to elect officers. Well, the officers, well, it was Jeff's idea to do this club, so he got to be president. Well, then that meant I was, of course, vice president, just in case anything ever happened to Jeff. You know, I, I could take over this club. And then we had to determine what the rules of this the rules. Okay, first thing, we're 10 years old, 9, 10, I can't remember exactly, but 9, 10, somewhere in there. The first rule was, no girls. No girls. No, we don't want any girls in our club. And then we start thinking about, well, then what boys in the neighborhood do we want? How about Tom? No, don't like Tom. Todd's bossy. What about Tommy? No, Tommy's me. Well, so it ended up, we had a club of just me and Jeff. That was it. Nothing else. And needless to say, our club didn't last very long. It's hard to start a club when you're 10 and particularly selective. It's even more so when you're trying to start a kingdom or maybe a nation. So I was trying to do a little research this week, and I'm not, this is not a civics lesson. So understand, I'm a preacher, not a civics teacher. But the United States as a nation went through some transitions when it was formed. 1763, when the war was declared, until the Treaty of Paris in September 3rd, 1783, 20 years later. But when the nation of the United States of America was formed, they said, well, we need some rules that we're going to have to live by. What are they? Well, there is a constitution. And it tells us what we do. And, and some people in the states didn't like the constitution, so they said, well, we're going to have to add some other things. So they added the Bill of Rights. Okay. So this week I, I did some research about the Cherokee Nation. And again, I'm not a civics instructor, but I got it straight from the website. The laws are enacted by a 17-member legislative body known as Tribal Council. And the services are administered by the principal chief and the cabinet. So with any group or organization, we need to have rules to operate. Am I right? I mean, right, even as a church, we, we might not have rules that we operate by, but we have some things that we say, well, you know, we can't just, can't have anarchy here. Unless you want to take a flyer, you ready? Okay. There we go. 
But we need rules to operate whatever it's a, 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 a nation, it's a kingdom, whatever, club, whatever it is. So God appears to Abraham and he says, Abraham, I'm going to start a great nation with you. The only thing I want you to do is go to a land that I'm going to show you. It's a land that I'm going to promise. Abraham goes and they are ruled by judges. Oh, I'm sorry. The nation grows. They grow so big. There's a famine. They go to Egypt. They're enslaved in Egypt. And there they are. They're, you know, hundreds of thousands of people as slaves in Egypt. And finally, God speaks to Moses and says, Tell Pharaoh to let my people go. They take off. They get into the promised land. And they're ru ruled by judges. And while they're ruled by judges, it's okay. Things are good. There's been all kinds of different judges. But then the nation comes to Samuel and says, we've been looking around, Samuel. These judges just aren't quite what we want. Give us a king. Oh, we want a king. And Samuel says, oh, you don't want a king. God is your king. You just need folks to administer that. You don't need a king. And they said, give us a king. And Samuel says, well, you may get what you want, but you're not going to want what you get. And sure enough, that if you read all through the Old Testament, whether it's the northern kingdom or the split in the southern kingdom, they, they really struggled with their kings. First king was Saul. They said he was tall and he was handsome. They said he was a head taller than every other man. So he really stood out in the crowd. I guess you could say he knew how to get ahead. <laughs> That's the example. But... It didn't take long before they realized that Saul was crazy. Saul was crazy. And, and so David takes over. David is a, you know, David leads them in a very militaristic way, and they had conquered more lands and more territories, and things are great there. But as they're doing that, David, you know, David has his own sins, and David has his own problems, but he really set up a, a great kingdom as far as the nation of Israel. So then, after he passed, Solomon takes over, blah, blah, blah. That's the end of my history lesson, civics lesson stuff. There we go. But from that time on, the nation of Israel kept saying, one day, one day, there's going to be a king. He's going to be the king of kings. He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to be the Christ. All these words are the, that name that they were using for this wonderful king, this ultimate king that was going to come, lead them back and establish this kingdom on earth that was going to be so wonderful. And they kept waiting. They kept waiting for it to be like David. But that wasn't God's plan. They were waiting for this Messiah, this Savior, this Lord, this Christ, who would bring military might and social justice for all. And Jesus was born. And the angel says, you will call his name Emmanuel. He will be Lord. He will be Christ. He will be teacher. He will be the king of kings and the lord of lords. Wow, this is amazing. This is great. We can't wait. Jesus grows up and the people rally around him. And Jesus says, well, the problem is you've got the wrong idea of my kingdom. My kingdom and its rules are going to be different. And when he's before the pilot and the Roman administration... And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. It's a whole different kind of kingdom. So I thought this week as we were talking about Christ the King, what does it mean to live as citizens in Christ's kingdom? What does that look like? And it makes a difference. Because in John 13, 34, Jesus says, love each other in the same way that I have loved. Not lording over, ruling over each other, but loving each other in the ultimate way, sacrificially. And then in John 13, 15, the New Living Translation, he says, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. The goal today is for us to think about what that looks like in our lives and with the people that we interact with in, in our own <coughs> world. So I've got several different things, uh, four different things that I want us to say that I, I think are rules or things that we should do. 
according to Jesus, in loving other people. The first thing is, we should accept others the way that Jesus accepts us. Think about that for a moment. Accepting others the way Jesus accepts us. Wounds of rejection are deep, aren't they? When someone says they don't want to be your friend, or a kid says, I hate you and I don't ever want to be around you anymore, just go away, let me leave you alone. Or a husband or wife says, it's time to go. I'm done. The wounds of rejection are deep. We've all received hurting words from a parent or a friend, maybe a spouse. I heard this week that the new thing is, is called fexting on our phones. You know, you text people, but now it's fexting. Where couples are saying they're going to fight on their phones instead of in life, life person, so that way it won't, the emotions won't get out of control. So when they start fighting, I, this was a big news article this week. They, they said, She's going to go to one room, he's going to go to the other, and then they're going to text back and forth until they work their problems out. <laughs> but what have we gotten into? <laughs> what have we gotten into? But we've all received hurting words. And we all do kind of crazy things to fit in. What we wear, what we drive, how we talk, what teams we cheer for. We don't like rejection, we do things to fit in, don't we? Remember as kids, we would do stupid things? Yeah, yeah I wish we could have time in Bible State to talk about this one. What are the stupid things you've done to try and fit in? We, we won't go there today. And I won't go there today. But do you remember the movie A Christmas Story? About the kid that won the BB rifle for Christmas. His friends dare, you, your tongue won't stick to the pole if it's frozen and the kid sticks his tongue on the pole. <laughs> do you ever do that as a kid? No. I did. I have to admit, I did. <laughs> just to, to just to fit in. The trick is you push your tongue harder against the pole where it makes it warm and then it releases. You don't stick it in pole. That's for future reference. So everybody gets into that situation. There you go. <laughs> That's a voice of experience. <laughs> to tell you. John six thirty seven. Jesus said, the Father gives me my people. Every one of them will come to me, and I will always accept them. We are not turned away from Jesus. There are people in this world who are going to be upset with us. They're going to reject us. They're going to say they don't want to be with us. That is part of the human situation. But Jesus says, my people are going to come to me, and I'm always going to accept them. Oh, my goodness. So, it's Thanksgiving. You know it's coming. You're going to go off the family. Uncle somebody or aunt so-and-so is going to be here. And you know exactly who I'm talking about. <laughs> I hear laughs all over the congregation. You know who it is. They're going to talk about politics. Or they're going to be way too loud. Or they're going to make it all about them. Or they're going to throw a fit. Or they're going to, have a, they're going to show out in some way. These are the EGR people. You know what that is, right? Extra grace required. Extra grace required. And if you're not thinking of somebody right now, it might be you. <laughs> <laughs> but that person, they remember Jesus loves and accepts them too. Now, does that mean we have to be their best friend? No. But it means we need to accept them and show them grace. So this week, I want you to think of that person and how you can accept them as, as you go through your week. The second thing is, First of all, we must accept others the way Jesus accepts us. The second one is, we must value others the way Jesus values us. Think about that for a moment. This is our suffering. This is our value. What do we mean? How much are you worth? Well, if we sell or give our body to science or put it to ground, you know, when it's all said and done, I mean, outside of maybe if we, if we want to give our organs to others after we die. But there's some value there. But our worth is not in our body, our stock, our bank account, our possessions. But we are priceless to God. You know how I know that? Because of what we read today. God created you. Jesus died for you. And the Holy Spirit lives in you. Wow. 
and God wants to be with us for eternity. We are priceless to God. Our value is determined by two things. Or a value of an item is determined by two things. First of all, who made it? And secondly, what somebody is willing to pay for it. Think about it. Who made it? Would you rather have in your house for value a painting by Picasso or a painting by James Dean? <laughs> Let's be honest. I can't even draw a stick figure and make it right. What about a CD from your favorite musician or a song by Jimmy Dean? Not the country singer, but me. You don't want that. You don't. Well, you might. There'd be a lot of power you'd have over me if you had that. But, <laughs> but the value is in the one who is created. And our value is great because God is our creator. God has made us and we have value. But the second thing is, is what you are worth is what someone is willing to pay. Back in the 70s, when I grew up in the 80s, I collected baseball cards. I grew up in Cincinnati, and I was a big fan of the Big Red Machine. You know, Pete Rose, Joe Morgan, Tony Perez, Johnny Bench, all, you know, all these people. Wow, what a team, what a team. And so I went out and I had all these Pete Rose baseball cards. Oh, they were worth so much money, I couldn't wait. Oh, I, one day I'm going to retire with all, I'm going to sell all these baseball cards and I'm going to be rich. Until Pete Rose cheated in baseball. And now people aren't willing to pay as much as they should be willing to pay for a Pete Rose card. Now that card is not worth as much. Not even near a fraction of what it should have been. And so our value, think about this thing. We are created by God. The creation is there. The second thing is, what is somebody willing to pay for you? Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice. He gave his life on the cross for us so that we can have life everlasting. So this week, I want you to think of somebody who has low self-esteem or somebody who is feeling really down and out and affirm their value. The third thing is to forgive others the way Jesus forgives me. God doesn't carry a grudge. Wouldn't it be nice if humans didn't carry a grudge? Colossians 3.13, New Living Translation says, You must make allowances for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And Luke 6.37 says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. God doesn't carry a grudge, so why should we? But you know, you know, now you know, now you don't know what they did. Now you can right, right, but uh, but but but. There are some people that are carrying a lot on. And we can't judge our self-worth and our value based on someone else. Because it comes from God. It comes through Jesus Christ. And it is dwelled in us through the Holy Spirit. Folks, we must forgive as Jesus forgave us. Forgive us our debts, we pray, as what? Oh, whoa. Yeah. There's a condition in that prayer. Oh. Man, that stinks. I just want God to forgive me and not forgive you all, you poor sinners over here. Or you poor sinners, you know, I'm, I'm okay. God's going to forgive me. I'm forgiven, but I'm not forgiving you. No way. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So this week, who is it that needs your word of forgiveness and needs your word of healing? And the final one is this. Believe in others like Jesus believes in you. This is self-esteem. If we get to the root of who we are sometimes, and maybe a lot of times, we're insecure. We need affirmation and self-esteem. I'm speaking for males, but I'll speak for men. Men, are, men need it too. We act like we don't, but we do. We act like we're all, we got it all together, but we realize that sometimes we don't. We need that affirmation. We need that esteem in our lives as well. Research tells us this. 
The earlier you face rejection in your life, the worst issue you're going to have later in life. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I was pretty mean as a child. My mother made one bad mistake in her life. She said, I wanted twins, and I got them. Cheryl and Jimmy. I wanted a boy and a girl, and I got them. Cheryl and Jimmy. And Anne was an accident. So I, would, I always reminded Ann whenever we got in a fight about that. Well, Mom didn't want you, and Mom wanted me and Cheryl, but you were just a mistake. You were an accident. None of you all would ever do that as kids, would you? None of you all ever said that, did you? You never said me. <laughs> you have a question or you're loudly proclaiming it? <laughs> I thought you wanted a story to tell. We, we do it. But it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that once we tell people that, those words are out there and they rattle around. I'll tell you what. Am I wrong or am I right? You tell me. You can have ten people come up to you after you do something and go, Oh my gosh, that was wonderful. And one person comes up and goes, Well, you should have had more of this. You're going to go home thinking about that one person more than you are the other ten that said the positive thing. Am I right? Folks, believe in yourself and believe in your power and do not fall into that self-fulfilling prophecy of insecurity. Jesus never saw somebody the way they were, but saw them as who they could become. Hebrews 10, 24, he says, let's see how we can spur one another on the good deeds. I was teaching one time at Western. I taught freshman health there for a couple years. There was a kid, he was handsome and he was strong and he was vibrant. He was very personable and everybody just kind of in love him. And he just slunk his way through time. Just doing the very minimum he could and he goofed off in class and he acted up and he, he wasn't. And one day I said, Chris, I want to see you. Can I see you after class? And I go, ooh, I'm like, no, 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 this is not a I looked at him and I said, Chris, man, you have it going for you. You have it going for you. You're a freshman right now. Your whole world is in front of you. Do not mess up the gift that you've been given. Do not. You have so much talent. You have so much ability. You have so much going for you. Man, don't fluff off in your studies. Don't fluff off in your experience. This is a chance for you to fly. And for the next four years, every time he saw me, he went out of his way to run up to me and just give me a big hug. Hello, Dr. Dean, how are you? How are you? How are you? And he did graduate. I don't know whatever happened to him, but I know that he stayed in school and he didn't flunk out because he was on that path. What are the words that you can offer to somebody this week to say, man, you have so much more to give. You have so much more to offer this world. Believe in others. This week, demonstrate your trust in other people. Who needs your word of encouragement, your positive outlook? Jesus, listen, Jesus trusted his mission to 11 fishermen and tax collectors. We've been talking about tax collectors the last few weeks. And guess what? They turned the world upside down. We're here today because of their testimony. Who is it in your world this week that needs to be accepted, to be valued, to be forgiven, to be believed in? Offer those words this week. These are the rules of being a member of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. To love others as Jesus loved us. Jesus said, if you have the faith like a mustard seed, you can move mountains. And everything is possible for those who believe. Some of you are saying, but Jim, but Jim. Jesus says everything is possible. How can we become kingdom of God believers? It takes work. It takes loving and doing as Jesus did. To accept others as Jesus accepted you. To value others as Jesus valued you. To forgive others as Jesus forgave you. And to believe in others just as much as Jesus believes in you. So this week, Go be great lovers for God. Amen. Our
final hymn is. I don't have to. Rejoice, the Lord is King. Rejoice, the Lord is King. Let's stand and sing together. 715.